Then something momentous happens. After nearly a half millennium, God, the same God of creation, maker of all things, appears to a man called Moses. He has not forgotten the promises he made to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Nor has he forgotten his great plan to bring the opportunity of salvation to the whole human race. In fact, as we move into Exodus, we find that that plan has been taken up a notch. And so, according to the third chapter of Exodus, the Creator God appears to Moses in a vision of flame on Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. This is a manifestation of the same God we met for the first time in the opening verses of Genesis. The God who is both a God of revelation, yet also of mystery. He makes this clear from the start. When Moses inquires as to his name, God mysteriously answers, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. This is not the name of any God. This is a name of mystery, the name of a God infinitely above any being that dare call itself a God. Even the name itself is shrouded in mystery. I am. What could this mean? Perhaps one of the few things we can know for sure about it is that it speaks of a God who is absolute and eternal. So secret is this name that the later Jews would be fearful even to speak it. They were not even permitted to make an image or idol of their God who was so indescribable that words or a statue could never capture who and what he is. Now this is evidently something far removed from the gods of pagan peoples, whether the Greek Zeus, the Roman Jupiter or the Canaanite Baal. Their names are well known. It is a simple thing to erect physical idols or likenesses of them. These gods were far from all powerful. Their power was limited to a particular territory or area of influence. In other words, when he walked into ancient Egypt or ancient Rome, he would find people who worshipped, for example, a god of the stars, a god of the moon or the sea, and so forth. He would not find a god who claimed to be god of absolutely everything that existed. So what happens when the one absolute god of everything comes into contact with gods who are limited in scope and power? We find exactly this in the extraordinary spiritual battle that explodes on the pages of the book of Exodus. As we know, Pharaoh refuses to let the people of Israel go, and so God unleashes ten plagues on the nation of Egypt. What is often not fully understood is that these plagues are really all about a tumultuous battle between God and the gods of Egypt. The focal point of each plague, the object on which each successive plague is centred, is aimed at a different Egyptian god. For example, the Egyptian god Hapi was supposed to be god of the river Nile, so when God turns the Nile to blood, what it indicates is that he has defeated and killed Hapi, who was supposed to be the god over this sphere of influence. The Egyptian god Heket was represented as having the head of a frog. So what does God do? He sends a plague of frogs, which indicates his superiority over this so-called god. And it's the same with all ten plagues. In all ten cases, a different Egyptian god was targeted, thereby demonstrating God's superiority over the gods of that nation, the point of which was to show that God was the only true God. Not only does the message go out to all Egypt, but no doubt also to the nations beyond. It is the message that Egypt and her gods have been soundly defeated by a new God who has arisen and will shake all the earth. This God of all the earth is extending his power and showing himself to all the nations of the world. He has come to reclaim all peoples who fell away from him in the earliest days of humanity. And so with Pharaoh's power soundly broken, the people of Israel are freed and God's word to Abraham of half a millennium before is fulfilled. Now we might see in our own generation a further battle between the true God and the gods of the nations. For our own Western world has drifted so far from the God of its own ancestors that they have forgotten all about him and have chosen rather the gods of luxury pleasure and worldliness. Perhaps a time will come when God will challenge these false gods, shake them to their core, and so turn the attention of a wayward world back to him. Who knows, perhaps COVID-19 was one such way in which God forced a lockdown situation, cut off access to many of our Western pleasures, especially the much-prized God of Mammon, and so attempted to turn attention back to him, our creator and traditional God. And so, after some 400 years of slavery, the sons of Abraham are freed from Egypt, and so come together at Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. 
This epic story, The Exodus from Egypt, is one of the greatest episodes in the history of humanity. If we could see it on a spiritual level, we'd be astounded at the degree of spiritual warfare that lay behind it. For here we have nothing less than the establishing of the people through whom salvation would come. As Jesus would say many years later, salvation is of the Jews. This is very important to the question raised at the beginning of this talk. It means that salvation was revealed by God through the Jews' one race. Salvation does not come through any other people. God sanctions salvation through one people through whom the message would go out to the world. As the prophet Isaiah would later say about Israel, I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Isaiah 49 verse 6 The later rabbis would say that when the high priest went into the temple to offer the annual sacrifice on the Day of Atonement, he stood not just between God and Israel, but between God and the world. Ultimately, through Israel would come the Messiah and Saviour of the world, and come he did one and a half thousand years later, in the form of Jesus, born about 4 BC in Bethlehem. After the Exodus, the Hebrews went through a grueling 40-year trial period in the wilderness, but were eventually cemented in Canaan, the Promised Land, which duty became Israel. Once in Canaan, the children of Israel, in a sense, do what Abraham had done half a millennium before. They hold high the name and reputation of the true God. As they march into Canaan, they bring the message of that true God with them. This message that they bring is one that is unheard of, at least among the Canaanites. For they bring the message of monotheism, that is, belief in one God alone. An idea that would seem very strange to the people of the ancient world. The other nations had their gods, but for a people to hold that there was only one God was unprecedented. Not only that, but the added claim was made that all other gods were charlatans. Other religions had their gods of limited power or territory, but here were the Israelites proclaiming the ultimate in the very concept of God, the concept of one being who subsumed the very concept of deity. Other gods might claim to be gods of the land or the sea or the moon, but God alone is God of all those things combined, in fact, of all creation. 400 years previously, Abraham had proclaimed to the Canaanites that one God, and now here, nearly half a millennium later, the Israelites arrive in Canaan and do the same. And they have a mandate to fulfill. They cannot afford to turn to the left or to the right. They cannot afford to fall away and start worshipping idols. Their mandate is to proclaim God to all the world that had forgotten him. And so, as Israel is about to enter the Promised Land, Moses instructs them with some urgency he says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Why does he urge them to tie the laws to their hands and bind them on their foreheads? The hand symbolizes action what we do, the forehead symbolizes the mind, what we think. The biblical laws of God are be so, to be so imprinted on our minds and reflected in our deeds that the lewd ways of the Canaanites in the world do not get a foothold. We must keep the world not only away from our actions but also from our thoughts. This speaks of purifying not only our deeds but also our minds and means keeping the world out of our minds, our thought patterns. How do we get the decrees of God into our minds? By meditating on them day and night, not letting worldly thought patterns get into them. Joshua and Moses knew how easy it would be for worldliness to creep into our minds, to dictate the way we think and see the world. They knew that the life patterns of the Canaanites could be so deceptive that it was easy for their ways and ideas to influence the Israelites and slowly turn them. The message here for both them and us is that the word of the Lord is to be foremost in our thinking. Israel had to maintain their separation and be a light to the world for the world's sake. Not only are the Israelites to worship the one God, but it is of supreme importance not to go near the gods of other religions. The Ten Commandments tell us plainly, You shall have no other gods before me, 
You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. The message here, too, is that there is only one God, and only one way to reach God. It could not be made clearer. There is also a sense here of imploring the Israelites to do everything in their power to keep to this one God, and not to stray to other ways, not to turn aside to foreign gods or foreign religious ideals. But as we know, Israel did not stick to this mandate. They soon fell into sin, and in fact became, began worshipping Canaanite gods and taking up their practices, such so that God had to judge them, sometimes harshly. But Israel's sin could not nullify the plan of God. Despite their years of rebellion against him, God produced some one and a half thousand years later after Moses the Messiah, Jesus, who would make atonement for the sins of the whole world and who would finally reverse the curse of Eden. And born he was, Jesus of Nazareth. True to God's plan, Israel had indeed produced the Messiah who was to bring to all men the opportunity of returning to the ideal of a whole world under its true God and Creator. This mandate is confirmed again and again in the Gospels. The old man Simeon prophesies over the child Jesus that For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. John the Baptist later announces, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The famous John 3.16 tells us that For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. During the era of the law of Moses, the focus tended to be chiefly on Israel, yet also open to those Gentiles who chose to embrace it. In the era of Christ, however, the focus is on the whole world, Jew and Gentile alike. Now the time had come. The final end of God's plan started from the time of the fall, now came into effect. Now the whole world must be told the whole plan of God's salvation, and with some urgency. God had indeed brought the offer of salvation to the world as promised back in Eden. He had done so in an unexpected way. God himself had come in human form to be the sacrifice that would be the means of which the world, having long forgotten him, could now return. But that word of salvation must be taken to the world. The world that had drifted from God since Eden, and especially since the Tower of Babel, must now be brought back into the fold. But God's humanity must come to the understanding that just as a new era was dawning, so old ways must be forsaken. For a mankind had developed various ways of their own to try to find God, but God had engineered one way only, and it was for his followers to proclaim to the world what that one way was. In John 10, Jesus makes the statement, I have sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Here he is speaking of the Gentiles, who must, along with the Jews, be brought to faith in him. Under the covenant of Moses, God dealt chiefly with Israel, although at that time salvation was indeed open to those Gentiles who might come into contact with Israel. But in the new covenant of Jesus, God will deal with all the world, Jew and Gentile alike. All the world must be faced with a choice to return to him. This is why Jesus announced, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to me. John 12, 32. In the famous John 14, verse 6, Jesus makes the clear statement that I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He did not say that he is a way or one of various ways. He said that he is the way. This means that he is the only way, the only bridge to God. He also says here that he is not so much a truth, but the truth. If he is the truth, then it follows that there is no other truth that will bring us to God. No other religious source or religion can claim to bring their special truth of how to get to God. This is why we also read that whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. It could not be made clearer. The one God had opened up one way to get to him, and one way only. In fact, the greatest possible way, his son, God become flesh, higher than all the earthly ways of men.